Our next session is a uh, keynote speech, um, and I'm delighted to invite uh, Tom Wallin, um, who is the Editor-in-Chief and Executive Vice, Pre Vice President of Energy Intelligence, to uh, introduce our next speaker. For our, uh, our first afternoon keynote presentation, I'm very pleased to welcome Ryan Lance, who's the Chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips. As the head of the world's largest independent oil and gas producer, he brings a unique perspective uh, on the challenges currently facing the industry. While ConocoPhillips is a major player in the shale sector in the US, it also has significant production elsewhere in, in Canada, in the Asia Pacific, in the Middle East. Uh, and this contrasts with other uh, US independents that have many times divested uh, uh, entirely from their uh, other operations to focus entirely on, on shale, or at least on North America. Um, the diverse upstream portfolio of ConocoPhillips um, gives him an ability to evaluate the relative merits uh, and unique uh, economics of shale uh, compared to other upstream opportunities. Today he's going to share with us some of that wisdom, uh, and he's going to talk, his talk is entitled Adapting to an Industry in Transition. Um, I'm very eager to hear what he has to say, and I know you are too, so uh, without further delay, I'm going to turn over the floor to Ryan Lance. Please welcome Ryan Lance. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Tom. It's certainly a pleasure to be back here uh, today. There's an old saying in this business and others that says those who can't remember the past are doomed and condemned to repeat it. So since joining the industry in the early 80s, I've now been through six downturns. I've been through five upturns, and like you, I'm waiting for the next upturn. Now all these cycles have unique causes and timings associated with them, but they have similar impacts. We have overhiring, then we have underhiring, overspending, then underspending, acquisitions, then divestitures, profits, then losses, government concern about energy security, and then when prices are low, little interest in energy policy. So let's ask, what does this downturn tell us? What are the new rules of the game? How do we adapt to an industry that's in transitions? So I'll suggest you six points. One, the outlook really has fundamentally changed. U.S. tide oil has boosted supplies. And at the same time, world economic growth is uncertain. Certainly, it is slowed on the demand side. Two, U.S. production is currently declining, but it will, it will come back, and quite strongly. Uh, three, U.S. tight oil will, will contribute to new shorter cycle market volatility in the future, and that's because of its very nature. Four, we've traditionally pursued mega projects, but now they face some pretty challenging economics. And five, these realities are forcing businesses to change their strategies. And six, and finally, government still plays a key role in our long-term prospects. So I'm gonna share a few ideas on each one of these topics, and then we'll engage in some questions and answers. So clearly our industry is hurting. Prices were $100 a barrel in mid-2014, been as low as $30. I usually tell our folks and people that not many industries in this world lose 70% of their revenues in six to eight months period of time. That's what our industry's gone through. Certainly prices are better now, 45 to $50 range, but they're still pretty low to, sig to significantly justify ramping investments. Now, a big contributor to this global surplus was increased U.S. oil and NGL production. Since 2008, it grew by 87%, or nearly 6 million barrels per day. That gave our U.S. Congress the confidence to finally approve crude oil exports, which ended a 40-year ban. And the U.S. production was pretty resilient. It increased even 10 months after the price downturn and finally peaked in April of last year. But since then it's down by about 800,000 barrels a day. Now production remained strong for several reasons. It took time for the activity to ramp down. Rigs were under contract. Some producers kept drilling to hold their leases. They also kept high grading their acreage to drill only the best areas. Besides that, quite a few already drilled wells were being completed. Several financial factors uh, mitigated the low prices, such as production hedging, and lower service costs. Now, as Tom said, we have a major position in the tide oil or shale. We've learned a great deal about it. It's enormous potential, relatively low supply costs, short cycle nature, 
you can go from exploration to production in less than a year, and those are pretty big advantages. Now, this energy renaissance occurred uh, first in the U.S. It has now spread to Canada. And at the peak of the industry, we were investing $100 to $200 billion annually in North America. But those free spending days are over. I've seen a prediction that through 2019, cuts in global upstream spending will total $1.6 trillion. These cuts are impacting, having impacts far beyond just the E&P business to our supply chain, to other industries, and even the broader economy. Now, looking back, low prices have always forced cutback investments. Drilling goes down. This historically reduces production. But the U.S. declines have been rather modest, and, and declines could take longer elsewhere in countries with longer project cycle times in our business. Meanwhile, again, historically low prices have stimulated demand. These, fa these factors together typically soak up any surplus in the business. So today's low oil prices, you would argue, are sowing the seeds from the next up cycle. That's the theory. The questions are when and to what extent. Will we see a strong upturn, like after the 2008 recession? Will it be more gradual? Will geopolitics play a role? Will the upturn be steady? Or will prices oscillate? We don't know for certain, but there are some elements I think you should consider. One, the US has enormous light oil resources. They could help fill the future gap between world supply and demand. Tide oil offers shorter response time than other production, with one exception, probably spare OPEC capacity, and with one caveat. There will be some lag time, which I'll discuss here in a bit. Tide oil offers the optionality needed during price volatility like today. It's due to the shorter cycle time, the flexibility. It doesn't take long to drill new wells. They come on at pretty high rates. And there is usually infrastructure nearby from previous production that's been produced. And there's spare capacity available due to that recent uh, production decline. As prices rise, you can drill new, new wells pretty fast. As prices fall, you stop drilling. The natural decline takes over. You can ramp up or ramp down along with commodity prices. Also consider the supply costs in U.S. Tide oil. They're lower than many other non-OPEC sources, even though not as low as some of the OPEC conventional production. So Tide oil will draw capital away from the longer major projects elsewhere, but there's an ancillary impact from Tide oil. Its flexibility will contribute to shorter cycle price volatility. Higher prices would lead to more drilling. Production would rebound after a lag, ultimately force prices back down. Drilling activity would fall, and the cycle would repeat itself. So U.S. Tide oil will, will serve as the marginal supply source. That's due to its short cycle time and its low cost of supply. The oil would rebalance the market as prices rose or fall. Now, there's a big, big reason for this cost competitiveness. We've had improvements in productivity and efficiency across the board. As a result, the three best plays in the U.S., the Permian, the Eagle Ford, and the Bakken, new wells have remained economic even at $40 a barrel Brent prices. A number of innovations have made this quantum differences, such as seismic and basing analysis. They help us identify the reservoir sweet spots and drilling locations. We're better optimizing well spacing and stacking distances. And it tells drilling hundreds and thousands of wells. We now have low-cost digital sensors that we put on our wells, capture huge volumes of data. The big data helps us better model and predict results without having to experiment constantly. During the drilling, we geosteer our well bores into the best rock. And we've optimized those fracture stimulations as well. We're taking longer horizontal well extensions, some two to three kilometers in some cases, and we doubled the fracture sizes. All these innovations help contribute to flow rates that are higher than, than each successive year in the past. We've also enhanced that drilling efficiency. We're drilling multiple wells on one pad, reduces our surface footprint, it reduces our water consumption. It has uh, standardizing facilities. We're not custom designing everything. We're optimizing our purchasing. We're doing different kinds of training, different kinds of mains. It goes on and on and on. So we're climbing that learning curve. And it's still early in the tidal reservoirs. Our expertise today is about where we were several decades ago with conventional reservoirs. So in the U.S. baseball terms, third inning of a nine-inning game. And that progress will continue. In fact, low oil prices are strengthening the need for ongoing innovation. So there's a strong case for resiliency of U.S. tide oil. Still, when the demand rises, there will be an initial constraint on production increases. The downturn impacted not just producing companies, it also hooked the service and the supply side. They will need time to ramp back up. Remember, I mentioned 10 months it took for our production to decline. We expect a longer delay on the way back up for several reasons. Producers' financial resources have been strained, 
particularly for some of the smaller companies. When prices do rise, they're going to have to repair their balance sheet. They also want to see how long the upturn is going to have legs or if it's uh, really a flash in the pan. Also consider now that there's less than 500 rigs operating in the U.S. That's down from about 2,000 in 2012. The rest are demobilized. The crews have been laid off, along with about 60% of the U.S. fracturing uh, field workers. Many of those won't come back. They've worked in other, they've now gone to work in other industries. And also we've had 70 U.S. service firms declare bankruptcy over the last two years. So the service industry will need some time to recover, to raise capital, recruit and train crews, and redeploy its equipment. But there is some offsetting factors involved here as well. The greater efficiency that I mentioned. Fewer rigs are going to be needed to increase production, but there still will be a lag in time. Now I mentioned uh, we expect fewer near-term investments in some of the mega projects. During the 90s and 2000s, we faced, as, a, as companies, restricted access to resources. The industry needed these mega projects for growth. That was despite their high cost, their complexity, and their very long cycle times. Then Tidal changed those dynamics. It offered major re new resources, at least in North America, where land and access was available. Now you add in low commodity prices, price volatility, and intense competition between E&P opportunities. We don't foresee many new major project sanctions in the near or midterm. Companies are looking elsewhere. They're looking for shorter life cycle projects with low cost of supply and specifically turning to tide oil. Our own mega projects are now completed or nearly so. We have, they do serve a place in the portfolio. They offer stable production, they offer provide cash flow, they do this for decades and through multiple cycles and they also offer some economies of scale. There are always ways to reduce the cost and improve the efficiency as well. Now at this time of transition for our industry, business strategies are also having to change. Some companies are moving away from production growth as a driving goal. It no longer makes sense to them, not for lower, more volatile prices. Instead, they're going back to the future. They're emphasizing financial returns. Certainly many companies did this in the 90s. It helped them, it worked then, and it'll work today. In pursuing returns, you prioritize opportunities that contribute to profitability, even despite a very uncertain price outlook. There are prerequisites. You need a diverse, flexible portfolio, one that offers lots of opportunities and low cost of supply investments as well as shorter cycle times. You just can't tie up capital in this business years before earning a return. Projects with these kinds of attributes are being sanctioned, while more expensive projects are canceled or being deferred. Now it also helps to have legacy assets in your company that have a low decline and low risk. They offer a base of production and cash flow, and then maintaining a strong balance sheet is a necessity. So is safety and environmental stewardship. Now, we're, we're, we're optimizing our operating procedures as well. Greater efficiency also benefits us throughout the market cycles. We expect to save annually billions of dollars as well from cost deflation in our wealth side of the business. We cut our capital program more than two thirds. In 14, we invested $17 billion into our company. Last year, about 10. This year, about $5.5 billion. And we're getting about as much work done for $5.5 billion as we were for $17 billion. We're focusing on both, reducing the capital intensity and increasing the capital flexibility in the government. But governments also face some realities. Just as companies are adapting to the new market realities, so must producing countries. They need a competitive business environment in order to attract E&P investment, and that starts with resource access. Now, the U.S. energy renaissance occurred mainly on private land. We could lease it from the owners, and development followed. But both there and in other countries, there's a lot of potential on government land. The problem is gaining access. It can be difficult or impossible, particularly for IOCs looking for opportunities for resource-rich nations. That access will be needed in the future, particularly if the world economy revives. Also consider the population growth. Today, we're 7 billion people, growing by 9 billion by mid-century. That alone will inevitably increase energy demand. Governments should also recognize one other truth. Even in low-carbon scenarios, oil and gas will still be needed. So there should be a level playing field for all energy sources with no preconceived winners or losers. We do need it all. Governments must offer regulatory and fiscal stability and honor contractual terms. Regulatory overreach is a threat, so are overlapping and conflicting local and national regulations. They can slow down the permitting and development or even block it in many cases. And we're also concerned about the misuse of regulations for unintended purposes, such as in the U.S., where today there's an effort to use the Clean Air Act to regulate carbon emissions. We believe, too, that regulation should be subjected to a cost-benefit test. And last, 
producing countries should recognize the impact of the price downturn on the ENP industry. Some, com some countries have, like Malaysia, for instance, where they have initiative to reduce costs across their entire upstream sector. But other countries were not seeing favorable responses, and some were actually seeing tax increases that would further reduce investments. So in conclusion, this transition we're engaged in is extraordinarily difficult, and it likely won't end soon, barring the unforeseeable. The oil market has changed in ways we couldn't have expected just a decade ago. U.S. tight oil production will remain a key factor. Business cycles will remain with us, and company strategies have to adapt. And yes, government policy remains an important factor. Even so, you know, I'm confident the industry will come out of today's downturn even stronger, certainly more efficient and more tightly focused. But when it comes to getting there, fasten your seat belts because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask a few questions and then open it up to the floor. Uh, I'd like to start off by just, uh, you know, we spoke about the, the, the shale and tight oil uh, revolution in North America. What are the prospects of that uh, propagating uh, outside North America? You know, when and how and you know, how, what, what are the ingredients of that? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question, Tom, because uh, U.S. North America is not the only country or countries blessed with the kind of geology that's going to work. We know other countries have this geology that work primarily, you know, some's going on in Argentina today. You know, if you follow the old seaway, Cretaceous seaway that, that established all the way through North America down through Central America into South America, that geology is gonna be receptive to, uh, to unconventional plays. Um, China's having some luck in the Sichuan Basin with some tidal, tight sort of gas plays. So it will, uh, progress throughout the world, and that's what's important to understand as well. Now, it will be slower because of some of the constraints that I talked about. You know, private land ownership and that, that motivation is very, very strong to get development going and going quickly, and that doesn't necessarily exist uh, around the world today. So there's going to be that regulatory framework in how you share the impacts or share the, share the profits with the local and regional communities that are maybe impacted by some of the development. The governments are going to have to figure that out in order to accelerate the development and, and access to the resources they have. But this will go around the globe. It'll just take a little bit longer time. And any particular countries or areas that you think are most? Well, I think, uh, you know, again, up, up and down sort of the, uh, the Western Hemisphere from yeah. the north on down. Uh, I think there's places here in Europe that are perspective. There are certainly places in China that are perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it, will, it will propagate. And, and staying with the topic of, uh, of shale oil and, and, and tight oil, you described it in your speech as being a marginal, the marginal barrel, effectively, and, um, uh, but also contributing to, I guess, some, some price volatility as well. Is it, is it possible for, uh, for shale to be a, um, a swing supply source, to be something that sort of puts a, a, a floor and a ceiling on, on oil prices? Well, I think not only is it possible, I think, uh, you know, the marginal, when, when you think about the marginal barrel required to satisfy demand today, I think it lies right in the cost of supply that uh, onshore shale and tide oil is in. So we have some, some cost of supplies that are resilient down to 20 and $30 a barrel, and some of the more fringy areas of the resource is up at 70 to $80 a barrel. Right. So yeah, I think today to satisfy that marginal demand, that barrel, it sits Right in the uh, right in what the unconventional, the tidal or the shale developments can deliver. So yeah, I think it's going to be a swing. It's going to be a swing producer. As I said, it can react much faster than the typical cycles in our business over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And that's what's unique about what's going on. That's why we have to think about this business differently today than we did just a decade ago. Good, good. And a, a question, just a question on ConocoPhillips itself. I mean. Um, I, I personally sort of sort of wonder who who are your peers? I mean, you've got um, you know you're twice you, 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 you know I guess by definition a U.S. independent, but you're twice as large as the next one in you know in terms of production anyway. Um, in terms of oil and gas production, I think uh, ConocoPhillips is the same size as ENI, mm -hmm. which is the sort of smallest of the international majors. Um, what 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 is what's your peer group, and does that confuse investors? <laughs> 
No. Uh, yeah, we get we do get some questions about you know are you fishing or fowl? Are you you know you're not are you an independent? Are you more like the integrated majors, at least the upstream part of the integrated majors? And uh, you know we we know who we are, so we're pretty comfortable in our shoes uh, today. And I, I I jokingly say that's your problem to figure out, not our problem, because we know who we are. And and I say that because uh, we do believe in the in the kind of volatility in the world that we're in today, having a global diverse resource base is important in this business today. So we're not a, we're not relying on one geology or geography or area of the world or one resource type or oil versus gas. We have LNG, we have oil sands, we have unconventional. You know, we're, we're big in Europe, we're in Asia, we're in the Middle East, we're in North America. So we believe in a, a global diverse portfolio is pretty important. Now, when we run the company though, we recognize who our competitors are. Not so much benchmark our peers, but we know who we're competing against. And typically international in the big plays, we're competing against the largest of the integrated companies. In, in North America, in the shale plays, we're competing against the, the best of the independents. Um, I think Scott Sheffield's uh, talking after that. You know, we, I asked my guys, how are we doing against Pioneer? How are we doing against our, our uh, fence line neighbors? Uh, that's how we have to judge our performance. So we're pretty ambivalent. We're pretty, you know, we look at who our direct competitors are that's who we have to outcompete in the marketplace, and that's who we're that's who we're competing against. And it is some of the smallest independents, all the way to some of the largest integrateds. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, open it up to the floor for some questions. Hi, uh, Nigel Hayes, formerly of Talisman Energy and Enquest. Um, Ryan, I'd like to ask um, your view on what the constraints are on tight oil in in North America. I, I was very struck by how incredibly rapidly it grew. Um, what stops it when, if, when and if the price comes back a bit, growing that fast and some more, and how high can it get? Yeah, I would say it's a, it's a good question. I'd say there's a couple of uh, natural constraints that exist in the business that we worry about and think about quite a lot. One, uh, one rests in the infrastructure. So it, there's uh, you know, movements afoot to stop some of the infrastructure that's being built in North America, both to get oil evacuated out of the country and really oil moving from Canada back down to the U.S., which has a, has a side impact on some of the conventional light oil production that's going on as well. And also when we look at it, the, this light oil comes, is very gassy, which is why you know, we have a century of gas supply at a very low cost, a flat supply curve in North America today because it comes, uh, even the conventional light oil comes with a lot of natural gas production. So that infrastructure is necessary. It's going to be the, the gas plants and the ability to separate the, the NGLs from the, uh, from the uh, methane. So a lot of that investment is going to be required in, in places like the Permian that is growing pretty dramatically, not so much in the Eagleford and the Bakken that are established place. So one, I would say the infrastructure can be a constraint if there's not enough capital from the midstream companies to put into that business. And then secondly, it's the, uh, it's the threat of regulation. It is really the threat of, you know, uh, uh, over-regulating the business to the extent of hydraulic fracturing. And, uh, you know, if, if we don't do our business right and don't do it sustainably, uh, there's some of that, that threat on the, on the regulatory side. But our view is that's only just going to slow things down and probably lengthen that cycle. And it's going to look differently, frankly, in different states around the U.S., it's not going to be a ubiquitous thing across the U.S. Some states will be a lot more favorable than others. So we don't see that as adding a lot to the cost of supply, but it does have ability to stretch it out a little bit. So it's a constraint on the, on the pace of the ramp up, not so much an on-off trigger. Ryan, what about the availability of oil services as a constraint? Is that, is that oil field services? Yeah, you know, we, we, we think the, the ramp up will probably take a little bit more time because right. what I talked about in some of the, the losses that we've had in the industry. But we, we, we've been through this before and, you know, the counter argument to that a little bit is that our industry pays quite well. We're very mm -hmm. competitive. We offer great benefits, retirement plans, a base salary, so we're usually able to attract people back into the business. And as these cycles get quicker, you know, I think we will end up, we will be able to attract people back into the business. It may lengthen the time. But as again, that efficiency and innovation has gotten to a place where less equipment and hardware is required to deliver the same amount of uh, scope, mm -hmm. wells and, and production. So it takes less frac crews, it takes, it takes less drilling crews, and that's kind of the offset mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. that piece okay. of it. But we will need more people coming back into our business after this downturn where we've all had to 
crunch our companies in and, and conserve cash as we've, as we've lost all this revenues. April from Barclays. I just, you talked about wanting to do things differently so going forward, and your own capital numbers have come down from an investor of 17 billion down to 5.5 billion. As we go into a different stage of the cycle where you're going to see more volatility, how does that change your own capital allocation planning? Is the idea that you constrain capital, or will you be more volatile in the spending as well? Yeah, I think our, our view going forward is uh, as we think about a, a volatile market, I heard a question in the last panel session, you know, what's the chance of 80 or $90 coming back in the next four to five years? I think there's a reasonable scenario you can outline that says, you know, it might snap back. The concern is if it does, you might see $40 on the back side of it pretty quickly. So you have to, we have to be managing our capital program with that in mind. So while we'll ramp up some of the capital, with respect to uh, increasing cash flows from commodity price rising, we're going to be very, very careful. It is about returns. It is about making sure you can generate returns through the cycle. That's why we've been working so hard to reduce the break-even cost of our company now down below $50 Brent, because we have to get there. We have to be uh, resilient to the low end of the cycle. Our business knows what to do when the cash is there. That's not, not been a problem. And, uh, and I think for us, it's give a fair portion back to the shareholder and uh, get your debt down to where you have a very strong balance sheet for the next cycle, and then invest in a high quality, low cost of supply resource space that you have captured in your company, but don't get carried away with it. Don't let the capital grow because uh, you may be on the back side of it relatively quickly. And keep flexibility in your capital program because you gotta have some flexibility to throttle up and throttle down. Hi, uh, Jim Washer, Energy Intelligence. Um, you spoke at the start of your speech about over-hiring, under-hiring, over-spending, under-spending through the cycle, and you talked about how this cycle could uh, become shorter in future with the, uh, the way shale is just developed and can be ramped up and down. Um, does that mean you're going to kind of be able to learn from some of those lessons in the past so you'll maybe avoid some of this hiring staff, laying staff off? Because I know you talked about the salaries and the benefit plans, but if people are getting hired and then laid off on a regular basis at an even faster pace going forward. It still doesn't make it an enormously attractive industry if you're looking for a sort of stable long-term career. Yeah, I think it's uh, certainly an issue we've got to think about. We have to keep attracting new people into the, uh, into the business as the demographics in our business get a little bit older. I, I would say uh, this cycle was exasperated a bit because of all the learning that was going on, the efficiencies that were captured. And uh, now people are kind of, at least at our company, we're looking at it more as sustainable. How, how do you staff and how do you plan for the lower end of the cycle, keep some spare capacity to manage up in the cycle, but not get carried away like we were in the past with the capacity to ramp up from, say, you know, five or 10 rigs to 40 rigs. You know, now we don't need to ramp up to 40 rigs. We can really manage our business on a little bit more sustainable basis uh, because we're not chasing cash flows and we're not going not gonna to take our capital program back up to those kinds of levels. But it's going to be a challenge for the industry because the smaller independents don't act that way. They're going to, you know, any, any dollar that they get, they typically put right back to the bit and back into the ground. So it will still be a fundamental challenge for the macro industry as we try to manage through that. We are a industry of cycles. And um, I don't know if I have a, a great answer for that. We've managed it before, we'll manage it again, but it's never the ideal thing to go do. Okay, well, we'll wrap up a minute early here, and uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, please okay. uh, join me in giving a round of applause. Thank you.